Hi, it's Thursday, October 11th, 2018. Richard Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, bettingangle.us. You know, let's talk about the Wilder Fury sit down with BT Sports. I think it's worth a mention. But let's back up a few generations. And let's talk about Joe Fraser and Ali for a moment, because I think it applies here. You know, Joe Fraser and Ali, before their first fight, were very good friends. Very good friends. Understand, Ali had been stripped of his title. Right? Joe Fraser, behind the scenes, was actually helping Ali out. He opened some doors for Ali. He even lent Ali, according to some reports, some money, right? Ali had to support himself. Fraser, who didn't need to fight Ali, let's be clear here. Ali at the time was a controversial figure. Also, Ali's box office pull was really in question. Understand that rematch with Sonny Liston that took place in Lewiston, Maine hardly drew anyone. The venue was a very small venue. You don't have a lot of heavyweight title fights taking place in Lewiston, Maine because it's off the beaten path because you don't generate a lot of money fighting in Lewiston, Maine. But that's where they had to have the Ali Liston rematch. Right? Understand, Ali was so controversial that Ring Magazine one year announced that Ali would have been their fighter of the year. But by yelling at Ernie Terrell, what's my name, repeatedly during a heavyweight title fight, they thought Ali didn't deserve the recognition. They actually put that in the magazine. So Ali was a controversial figure and Fraser, right, helped him out behind the scenes and agreed to fight him agreed to give Ali a shot at the heavyweight title. And let's be clear, you know, Ali in his comeback before then didn't really take out the heavyweight division, right? He fights Jerry Quarry, known heavyweight at the time. But let's just say it wasn't like Ali took out all the top contenders. Yet Fraser allowed Ali to fight him for his title. Then they get on camera. And according to reports, Fraser was stunned, stunned by how Ali ridiculed him on camera, right? Ali is one of the great talkers in history, right? So Ali, of course, is ripping Fraser before their first fight, saying how Joe Fraser, the champ who has helped him, his longtime buddy, right? The guy who liked him won an Olympic gold medal, right? Ali in front of reporters is saying that he's the real champ, not Joe Fraser, that they gave Joe Fraser, who's then unbeaten, the heavyweight title, that Joe was undeserving, right? And Fraser showed big time restraint, right? He, he doesn't go out of his way to say that Ali's a draft dodger or to throw Ali under the bus. And Ali, quite frankly, was an easy target to throw under the bus because you already had people in the sport of boxing who didn't believe Ali deserved the recognition. So I was nervous. I was nervous before this Wilder Fury sit down. Right? I thought Fury, who's an Ali figure, was in a precarious position. I thought Wilder could say a lot of things that would have people cringing a little bit. Just like when Ali, before the thriller in Manila, called Joe Fraser a gorilla, right? I thought Wilder could be cruel. I thought, I thought these guys could be really cruel to each other. Now, in the 70s, we all laughed, right? But understand, the 70s weren't as PC as it is right now, right? The 70s had people like Richard Pryor doing stand-up, George Carlin doing stand-up. These days, the great stand-up guys like Chris Rock are afraid 
to go on college campuses. That's how PC it is. By the way, Chris Rock says so, right? That's how PC it is. You say something, someone's going to accuse you of being non-PC, right? People will boycott, right? In the 70s, guys could do ridiculous things, ridiculous things, and fans would forgive them. Today, you really can't. I'm not sure how Ali would translate today. So here you had Wilder sitting across from Tyson Fury. You could tell the guys have a lot of respect for each other. You could also tell that both guys, both guys understand that this fight is for legacy and that they need each other, right? They want to be remembered in history. To do that, you need to fight other great fighters, right? The bottom line is Ali needed Liston. Ali needed Joe Fraser. Joe Fraser needed Ali and Foreman. Ray Leonard needed Benitez, Duran, Hearns, Hagler, right? Carlos Monzon needed Benny Briscoe. Lennox Lewis needed Mike Tyson, right? So these guys want to fight the best. They understand the list of possible opponents is few and far between. The only guy who would give these fighters the added prestige that this fight is giving them, who's not in this fight, is Anthony Joshua. Right, so here you have two guys who need each other. Two guys with the same agenda. I don't believe for either guy. It's about the money. Don't get me wrong. It's professional prize fighting. The money is great. But both of these guys have been successful. I believe both of these guys are students of the game. And what they're really in it for at this point is legacy. Right? So Wilder tried to get a fight with Joshua. Couldn't do it. Received an email from the Fury camp. Fury apologized. Believe it or not, apologized on behalf of the United Kingdom for Wilder being jerked around for three months. Right? By a heavyweight champ who didn't want to fight him. And Fury said, if you make me an offer, I'll accept in three seconds. Folks, that's pretty much what happened. So Wilder wants to fight the best, right? Fury wants to fight the best. There they were on BT Sports, which is going to be televising this, sitting across from each other. Now understand, Fury was the low-hanging fruit. He's an easy target, just like Ali would have been an easy target in the early 70s coming off suspension, right? Now, Wilder is fascinating because Wilder shows incredible restraint. Let me point out at the beginning of the telecast, you could tell Wilder's going to take the high road. Now, keep in mind who Wilder is. He's knocked out every man he's faced. So when he's in these things, looking across at a guy, he's seeing a guy who's a future victim. Right? He's not, he's not winning photo finish fights. Right? He's not, you know, making excuses about being unable to use his right hand for 12 rounds. Right? With Wilder, Guys get hurt. Guys are on the canvas. Guys are down getting a count. Right? So when you have that kind of 100 mile an hour fastball, when you have what they call in the trade one punch knockout power, you're sitting there with a guy who you don't expect to be fully conscious at the end of the fight. Right? So here's Wilder sitting down. And he looks across at Fury. 
and Wilder starts to talk about how people see them, not him, but them, together, and how people are afraid of them because they sense the power they have. It's an interesting moment. I believe he's inviting Fury to take the high road with him, right? Fury doesn't. Fury takes the high road for the first few minutes, but then starts ripping Wilder. Before we get to Fury, let's talk about what Wilder could have said. Wilder, who doesn't go there, doesn't go there, could have said that Fury can't handle success, right? That Fury's unreliable. He could point out that Fury had the heavyweight title. Had the heavyweight title. And then failed drug tests. Had a drug problem. That Fury had the heavyweight title. Had a rematch signed to fight Vladimir Klitschko a second time. And that the rematch had to be canceled. Right? He could have joked that he wasn't even sure if Fury wanted this fight. Whether Fury wasn't going to self-sabotage like he did against Klitschko. Right? Self-sabotage. Um, you know, to have this fight get canceled like the Klitschko rematch was. Understand, too, at one point, Fury says, look, I'm younger than 40-year-old Luis Ortiz. Arguably, Wilder's biggest win. Wilder could easily have responded by saying, how old was Vladimir Klitschko when you beat him? Wasn't he in his late 30s? Right, Fury could have talked about how, excuse me, Wilder could have talked about how Fury is so unreliable that he gains an inordinate amount of weight between fights. Understand. It would have been relevant because Fury is there calling Wilder a cruiserweight. Fury at one point says he's going to go clip cruiserweights. He talks about how Wilder just is a few pounds above cruiserweight and looks slender. But Wilder doesn't talk about Fury's weight gain. Again, he's taking the high road. Understand, Fury's an easy target here. Very easy target. Understand, too, because Fury has opened up about his depression, Wilder could have said, hey, do you even believe what you're saying here? Wilder could have made oblique references to Fury's mental health, could have said lines that we would have read through that would have given Wilder plausible deniability, could have said lines like, hey, he is too crazy to know what he's saying. But Wilder doesn't go there. Right? He doesn't go there. Not at all. Understand, too, there's some blue moments where Fury, and for the record, I don't think Fury is racist at all, right? But Fury says some things because Fury, like Ali, runs off at the mouth that could have been misinterpreted, right? For example, he's sitting across from an unbeaten heavyweight champion, a guy with 40 professional fights, 40, right? And Fury then talks about how Wilder... <laughs> It's so politically incorrect, it's interesting. He talks about how Wilder has a basketball build. Of all the sports he could have picked, he could have said he has a swimmer's build. Right? No, 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 no. He goes straight to basketball and talking to a black guy. Right? He says that Wilder, a guy who's been in boxing long enough to be 40 and 0, to be a heavyweight champion, to have a greater than 98% knockout ratio, right? He actually calls Wilder a basketball player. 
Now you could imagine what Wilder could have said there. You could imagine the kind of light Wilder could have tried to throw at Fury, to paint Fury in a certain way, right? To make this fight even more controversial. Folks, Wilder doesn't go there. Understand this is a champion who is about boxing. Understand this is a guy who wants to fight the best. If it takes sitting across from a guy who's going to call him a bum from Alabama, which is what Fury does at one point. If it takes sitting across from a guy who's going to talk about his basketball bill when he has a huge knockout percentage. Okay. Wilder will sit there. Right? I got the feeling Wilder was the adult in the room, right? The interview falls apart in the last third of it. Wilder starts saying, bronze bomber. Fury starts talking about Wilder's alter ego, right? It's uh, kind of interesting, right? But just understand, while Fury is playing the Ali role, Wilder is trying to keep the focus on boxing. Wilder's actually trying to, dare I say it, help Fury. Right? Fury's throwing out lines like basketball. It's as if Wilder understands, oh, this is a little bit dicey. Let me just leave the basketball comments in the corner of the room. Right? Also, think about this. I thought this was interesting. Fury says, look, you know, you know you're not a real champ. Words to that effect. He says, that's why you call yourself the bronze bomber. Because you're not worthy of silver or gold. Wilder even takes that line, right? I thought Wilder would say, look, I earned this bronze medal. <laughs> I earned it. This is where I'm coming from. I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I'm a hungry fighter, even unbeaten at 40 and 0. Right? Even with the WBC crown, I view myself as a bronze medalist going for gold, right? He doesn't even go there. He just sits there and lets Fury diss his bronze medal. Right? Because he understands I need this guy for legacy. Right? Now, let's talk about the revealing parts here. And I thought it's noteworthy. I really enjoyed the show quite a bit, at least the first two thirds of it. You know, at one point, Fury actually says, I've seen all of your fights. Right? All of your fights to Wilder. Right? You could tell that Fury isn't just a savant. He isn't just a guy who's naturally gifted. But he's actually a guy who is a student. He's leaving nothing to chance. Right? Fury in revealing moments says, I've seen all your fights. He goes further. He starts comparing his defense. I know this is going to sound preposterous to many people. But he starts comparing his defense to Floyd Mayweather's. Now, I'm always fascinated by guys who learn skill sets that they don't really have to learn. Right? You look at Michael Jordan, dominant scorer. One of the dominant scorers in NBA history. You know he's a scorer the first time you see him on the court. And Jordan, for some reason had a need to put the same level of effort into his defense. So there's a stretch in Jordan's career where he is the best defensive player in the league. This is while being the best offensive player in the league. Right? I believe he wins defensive player of the league in 87 to 88 or something like that. Right? You look at LeBron James and you think to yourself, wow, this guy's 6'9". 
He's big. He has great low post moves. What possessed this guy to learn guard skills? Right? It's just one of those mysteries. Greg Maddox. Great pitcher, filthy stuff, Hall of Fame pitcher. But yet that's only part of the Greg Maddox story, isn't it? Because he won many gold gloves. Right? You have to look long and hard to find a better defensive pitcher. Maybe Jim Cott. Maybe. Right? So here you have Tyson Fury, big guy, 6'9". Great jab. Ambidextrous. But yet you could tell he takes great pride. I'm talking about great pride in his defense. Think about it. Right? I think Deontay Wilder views himself as a big hitter. He's focused on his knockout punch. Tyson Fury is focused on a lot of things that aren't obvious. So Fury talks about how he has Floyd Mayweather level defense. Understand Fury is looking at the great guys in history in certain parts of the game. I have no doubt that if a reporter asked Fury about Pernell Whitaker's defense, he'd have an opinion. I have no doubt. Right? Let me also say, too, and I thought this was interesting, Wilder, in showing great restraint, doesn't even talk about the fact that Fury's been dropped in fights. The person who does is Tyson Fury. He talks about how he was dropped. Not by big punchers, but by guys who weren't big punchers, who hit him when he didn't expect it, who he underestimated. The inference is he knows about Wilder's punch. He's not going to make the mistake of getting hit by Wilder. Right? It's interesting. So I'll just say this. I can't wait for this fight. This fight is one of those special moments when boxing exceeds itself. Now, sometimes these big fights actually deliver, right? The Thriller in Manila, folks, that's a great fight, period. Forget the fact that that's the end of the Ali Fraser trilogy. Sometimes these big fights don't deliver. The Vladimir Klitschko-David Hay fight had so much promise. You had guys like George Foreman there as part of the prologue before that fight, right? That fight had history all over it, but it didn't deliver, right? The fight itself was lackluster. David Hay just didn't have enough big moments to make that fight worth it. Right? I thought the Anthony Joshua, Vladimir Klitschko fight completely delivered. Right, You'll be talking about that fight 10 years from now, 20 years from now, especially if Joshua is able to keep the success going for several years like Vladimir Klitschko did in his prime. Well, just to understand, this fight has the possibility of exceeding those fights, right? First, it's the first time these guys have fought each other. We're not even sure what the dynamic's going to look like, right? Joe Fraser, by the time the thriller in Manila came around, he had already lost to George Foreman, right? He was viewed as a guy who had already peaked. Here you're dealing with two guys in their prime who are both unbeaten. You didn't have that. You didn't have that in the AJ Klitschko fight. Right? Klitschko was older. Klitschko had already lost to Tyson Fury. Right here you have the guy who beat Klitschko before AJ. Right, the guy who beat Klitschko when Klitschko had the title. 
and he's fighting a guy with a historical record and a historical knockout percentage. So the personalities, wow, they're as intriguing as this fight is. You're Deontay Wilder, your opponent starts talking about you being a basketball player, you being a cruiserweight, even though you have a 98% KO ratio. And you just sit there and you take it. Think about that. <laughs> it's crazy. Your opponent's been knocked down. You don't even mention it. Your opponent's had a drug problem. You don't even mention it. Right? Your opponent has had some turmoil in the corner. You don't even mention it. Right? Think about it. And then, of course, across from him is a figure who really is historical, too. Folks, I, <laughs> a guy who's been stripped of the belt, who is the lineal heavyweight champion, who's openly talking about his problems with depression, who has fought two no-name guys, and now is diving in the deep end of the pool against the unbeaten WBC champion, and he's going to do it in America, in Wilder's country. Right? Wow. Wow. This fight is special. I talk about a lot of fights here online. I don't get to talk about fights like this that often. They're rare. Let's enjoy the show. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to look at the BT Sports sit-down with heavyweight champion Deontay Wilder and lineal heavyweight champion Tyson Fury. Stick around for at least the first two-thirds of it. Let me point out, too, that these guys are so combustible that at the end of the talk, the interviewer backs away from the table. The two guys stand up, they're still talking. Members of the production team, believe it or not, <laughs> then have to come and separate the guys while they're continuing to talk smack to each other. Folks, I think that's organic. I don't even think the guys were putting on a show. I think they're so interested in getting inside each other's heads that they kept talking even as the camera was trying to stop rolling. Right? This is good stuff. Let me hear from you. I think Fury wins the fight. I've said so in other videos. Why? In part because of Tyson Fury's Floyd Mayweather type defense, as well as the fact that he's ambidextrous, as well as the fact that Wilder is a bit too reliant on that right hand, which I expect Fury to be able to block. But I understand there are many, many people, in fact, Wilder right now is the favorite in the fight, who think differently. Let's hear what you think. I hope you tell us in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.